Never before in the history of the American stage have you seen such high fun. It's bone chilling. It's spine-tingling. It's a musical. It's... It's a, it's a, a, a nifty laugh right and entertaining as it is exotic. Little Shop of Horrors is one of the more well-known musicals out there. Sure, it may not get talked about all that much in modern times, but generally speaking, most people are at least familiar with it, and those who know it love it. It's my personal favorite musical of all time, and the 1986 film adaptation is my second favorite film of all time. So what's there for me to say about it? Well, right now not much, but I'm sure you're familiar with the tale of Seymour Krellborn and his bloodthirsty space bulb, right? But what if I told you there was more than just a stage in film musicals? Of course, the more dedicated fans know about the original 1960s Roger Corman film the musical is based on. It's a public domain classic that's been passed around on VHS like wildfire, and know more for its confused marketing of Jack Nicholson than the actual movie itself. But what if I told you this isn't the only other Little Shop? Did somebody say Little Shop? Oh hey, Jaleese is back. Want to talk about the Little Shop of Horrors? Yes! Cartoon? Oh, God, what did I, I get, get myself, myself into? into? What if I told you they made our cartoon based on Little Shop of Horrors? It's not good. That is the end of the song. Yeah, I'm not making this up. In 1991, Little Shop debuted on Fox Kids, an animated cartoon based on Little Shop of Horrors. Why? Who thought this was a good idea? Well, it was produced by Saban. Who are they? Uh, they're, they're nothing too big. Uh, the biggest claim to fame is some obscure Japanese show called Super Sentai. Probably never heard of it. Uh, they shot new scenes for it with American actors and changed the name. That being... Uh, something called, uh, I, I don't know, Power Rangers. Go, go, Power Rangers! I... I never thought that Power Rangers would somehow be connected to a TV show about a giant killer plant. Well, that's because it's not really about that anymore. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So let's start with the beginning. And all of the questions that are on most of your minds. What? How? Why? Well, in terms of its actual conception, there isn't much information regarding it. Other than Saban Marvel being the production team, the concept is credited to one Ellen Levy, a surrealist painter? Assuming it's even the same one. Otherwise, there isn't much I can find on it other than that the producers wanted to make a show that is so unique, so funny, and so odd that a child who doesn't watch it will feel as if he's missing something. And what was that something, exactly? I see. That is... something. So you guys are probably wondering what exactly did they do to turn it into a cartoon. In essence, the show is a hybrid of the musical and the original Roger Corman film. Stylistically, the show is modeled after the musical, featuring musical numbers in every episode and retaining the New York-inspired setting. Many musical cues in the score are very similar to Daru from the musical. I was walking in the wholesale flower district that day, and I passed by this place where this old Chinese man. The elements of the Corman film are more obvious with the portrayal of Audrey II, or as it was known in the original film, Audrey Jr. For the majority of the show, Seymour tends to just call it Junior for simplicity's sake. That's not the only similarity though, right? Oh, not at all. They also gave him the hypnosis ability he had in the film, or planting the seed of an idea. <laughs> no, really, that's what he calls it. Like, every other word this dude says is a different plant pun. Chill out, Sprout. Why would anybody commit such a horrible atrocity? I've got a feeling in my roots that I'm about to change your mind with the seed of an idea. So after 13 episodes, the plant puns didn't grow on you? That's where the similarities end. See, they didn't do an outright television adaptation of Little Shop of Horrors. I mean, how could you? It's a very open and shut story. Boy meets girl. Boy meets plant. Plant eats boy. Takes over the world. The end. 
And while Little Shop of Horrors isn't the most violent thing out there, I can see older children being able to watch it just fine. You can't really use the main horror elements that made the original so good in a children's show. What? You mean a horror-themed movie from the 80s about an evil monster drinking blood and devouring entire cities isn't child-friendly? Let's compare it to a similar case, the real Ghostbusters cartoon. The original Ghostbusters film is like Little Shop in a few key ways. It has some adult themes and horror elements just like Little Shop, but the difference there is that the core idea of Ghostbusters works much better as a syndicated cartoon. Ghostbusters is a movie about four scientists going around and hunting ghosts. You can easily turn that concept into a syndicated Monster of the Week series where the four color-coded scientists fight a different type of spook, specter, and bugaboo. Little Shop, on the other hand, has a definitive ending. Depending on which version you watch, it either ends with Seymour and the plant dying, Seymour and Audrey getting married while the plant dies, or the musical ending where EVERYONE DIES IN THE PLANT APOCALYPSE! Can't really go any further if 90% of your five-person cast is mulch. So, to circumvent this, Seymour and Audrey are now in middle school. Orin is replaced with a bulky, retainer-ridden bully named Payne Driller. Mushik is largely the same, though he is clearly based on the musical's depiction of him, rather than the Mel Wells iteration from the original. Now let's address the green mammoth in the room. Don't you mean white elephant? Oh, you wish. Now in the musical, Audrey 2 is heavily implied to be a plant from outer space, an homage to the 1950s and 60s B-movies it was birthed from. It just pops in during an eclipse while Seymour is at a flower stand. In the Corman film, similarly he buys Junior from a market stand, but instead of the sprouting plant, he buys the seeds, making it unclear if it's a product of Earth or space. Here... Okay, are you guys ready for it? No. Good! So Audrey Jr. is found at the bottom of the junkyard and is revealed to be a member of a prehistoric species of flytrap that was alive in the Vegisoic era, where plants were the dominant species on Earth and were big enough to eat dinosaurs. Also, his pot is physically part of his body, apparently. Is it too late to drop out of the collab? Yes. Heck! We touched on how Junior is no longer the main villain and is shown to actually care for Seymour. He's based on the stereotypical 90s BIG BROTHER. He'll drag him and rib him like nothing else, but will at least help Seymour with his antics. Well, at least if there's something in it for him. You didn't even get to the two biggest aspects of Junior's character. Since he can't drink human blood for sustenance, he settles for whatever food he can find, whether it be pizza, burgers, a turkey, a 1700-piece vintage record collection, you name it. Doesn't pizza have plants in it? He also gains a new ability called vegetable magnetism. It basically gives him control over other plant life. He uses it in his attempts at getting the other plants to rise up and take back control over the planet. You haven't lived until you've seen a green wrapping flytrap ride a carousel horse into the sunset. Oh my gosh, we forgot about the wrapping! Oh god, right, right, right. So, as we mentioned earlier, the show being semi-based on an actual musical, there are two to three musical numbers in every episode. Audrey Jr. also has the majority of the songs, and with this being the 90s now, the funk and soul numbers Audrey 2 sang in the musical are upgraded to hip-hop. But don't get too excited. This was 1991, the 80s were still fresh in everyone's heads. So the rapping in this show is less biggie and more... You know, this whole thing kind of reminds me of something. The cheap animation, the songs, the insane concept, the self-congratulatory theme song. It feels very familiar. By the way, the bully pain driller, despite sounding basically exactly how you'd expect him to sound, got a couple of songs of his own to sing. We're always mean. You gotta stay up late at night. Stay for a fight. And if you take home rest, you never get respect. Boy, I really hope somebody got fired for that part. Audrey is also barely recognizable from her original incarnation. In this show, her gimmick is that in every episode, she's obsessed with a different career path. In the first episode, she wants to be a firefighter. In the next episode, she decides to become a telephone operator, a shoe saleswoman, a stagehand? Well, everyone has to have goals, right? Seymour is your bog-standard 90s cartoon protagonist. Aside from being clumsy, there's not much to him. That being said, I'll never forget his inspirational first words. I'm Seymour Krellborn, 
and I spent 13 years trying to become a nerd. What an icon. Let's talk about Skid Row itself for a bit real quick. It's called Skid Row. As in, the last place in the city you would ever want to be. Skid Row is the seediest, crime riddled burg you can stumble into, and everyone who lives there is either a scumbag or living in complete shambles, if not both. It's not supposed to be the actual name, but the creators of the show skimmed the first page of the 1960s script, saw the name, and used that as the name for the whole city. Oops. So, why am I bringing this up? Because the Skid Row in the show is not at all like the Skid Row in the source material. It's just another cartoon city. It's more Hey Arnold than Blade Runner. It's not struggling at all. This may seem like a minor change, but really think about it. Every character in Little Shop of Horrors has been shaped by Skid Row. Mushnick is the obvious one. His shop is struggling financially and has been for years. He can only afford two employees, Audrey and Seymour, the latter of whom only works there because he lives there. And both Seymour and Audrey's motivations in the musical stem from how horrible a place Skid Row is. The I Want song Skid Row is all about how everyone desperately wants to get out of there and live a better life. The reason Seymour keeps nurturing Audrey too is because he knows without it, he'll end up poor and alone again, and believes the only way he can live a happy life with Audrey is to keep the evil murder pot alive. And Audrey wants nothing more than to leave Orin and Skid Row and live somewhere that's green, but without the financial means to get out of Skid Row, she's trapped downtown seemingly forever. Now sure, it's a kid's show, you do need to soften it up to make it appropriate for all audiences, but years later the Powerpuff Girls did a perfect job at showcasing a Skid Row-like city in the Cityburg episode. This show's best attempt at making us see how skid this row is, is by having every store be a used store. Used magnets, used light bulbs, etc. Oh, and this one dude who eats flowers, what? Also, for some reason, Jack Nicholson shows up a lot in the show, but, like, he doesn't do anything. I, I don't get it. The show follows a syndicated cartoon route. Just take these characters and throw them in various situations. Here's the episode where they try out for the school play. Here's the science for episode. The Halloween special. The episode about why lying is bad. It's a Wonderful Life parody. The usual stuff. Except this time with a giant plant. So if Junior comes from a time where plants ruled the Earth, how does he feel about the modern world and how plants are relegated to salads and scenery? Oh, he hates it. Most of his plotlines are about his attempts to either make the plants stronger and take over once again, or establish plant rights. Yes, that is a sense I just said. His first plan involves giving plants brains again. So he cobbles together a plant Frankenstein monster named Stu. This man wants to play God and make his own literal Garden of Eden to create new man plants. This show is amazing. Another common theme in this show is its obsession with teeth. Like, it is absurd how often they force in a dental hygiene-related plot thread. I get that both films had scenes about dentists. I mean, Orin is a main character in the musical and gets a whole song about it, but that was just a single character trait. Here, it's like they saw how popular that one specific song and moment were and ramped it up to 11. That's a really good way to describe the show. They took two of the smaller ingredients of Little Shop and accentuated them tenfold. Yes, it was about a plant, but the fact that it was a plant was secondary to the fact that it craved blood and was indirectly responsible for murder. Yes, one of the main secondary characters was a dentist, but the fact that they were a dentist was only relevant for the sake of comedy rather than plot. Here they said, main character is a plant, therefore every episode has to be about him doing plant stuff, whatever that means. I think we've gotten the setup out of the way now, so how does the actual show fare? Well, we'll be back. <laughs> That was awkward, can I even put ads in videos yet? Anyway, let's look at the show, and by god, well, look at it. The show is very cheaply made with very minimalistic artwork. Half the time it doesn't even look finished. Backgrounds just kind of blur together at times, with action scenes happening in negative space. On the other hand, sometimes it can work. 
When the shop's shown in outline only, it is reminiscent of the opening of the 1960 Corman film, which is a nice touch. Until you remember the reason the Corman film looked like that was because it was filming in three days and had no budget. The animation itself is pretty choppy, too. Some parts are animated perfectly fine, but others just jump cut around, really showing how small the budget for the show was. The intro is probably the best animated part of the show, which isn't saying much compared to some of its contemporaries. Assuming you can get past the music. You mentioned the styles of music at play here, but now we have to actually get into the songs themselves. They're not that great. I used to be one of those veggie guys, asparagus to peas, with black eyes, so to speak. I turned over a brand new leaf. Love just makes you stupid, makes you act like a fool. Love is just the greatest, love is totally cool. Love guys turn to grand black, no food of now, just the sound of a lumberjack. No peace in the valley, all I hear is cars. Life so the cities can't see the stars. What am I doing here, 200 million years in the past? I find most of the songs unmemorable, nothing I'd actively find myself singing. Usually they're there to further the episode's moral. And then of course there are the Audrey Jr. raps. The most prolific songs in the mix. So I'm just gonna play a clip from two of them right here for you to judge for yourself. Lies! Big ones, tall ones, lies! Little bitty white ones, lies! Discreetly clean ones, lies! Uh-uh, I can't go for that mess. You ever thought about it? What a pain in the chest. Bro, joke. Oh, what a joke. This is serious, homie. It ain't no joke. Wait, you said you were playing two clips. I did. Oh. Yeah, the raps all sound basically the same. There's no variety in the backing music, it's all the standard upbeat hip-hop you'd hear from an early 90s kids rap song. Vanilla Ice, MC Hammer, Will Smith, Backstreet Boys, The Z Guys, yeah that kind. Sometimes the music doesn't even fit with the song they're singing either. Stephen Sondheim once said, When telling a story through music, content dictates form. So, in the song about Seymour wanting to be a star, why is everything so slow? A scientist renowned and great He goes by Gucci fashion play I'm gonna be a star S-T-A-R If there was ever a time for the random upbeat doo-wop music to play, it would have been there. One thing that keeps rubbing you the wrong way about the show is the comedy. We all thought it was funny. Oh, I agree, but not for the reasons they wanted it to be, and we will certainly get there. So what are you saying here? I'm gonna demonstrate. Here's a scene from the show that I re-edited myself. How does that look? Okay, cool. Now here's the original unedited clip from the show. You see what I'm getting at here? The show's comedic timing is off. They either dwell too long on something for it to be funny, or the opposite, they don't give you a proper beat for a joke to land. It's, it's weird, and kind of hard to explain without showing you directly. Part of it is also the way the lines are delivered. For a lot of them, it comes across as if they just recorded their first read-through. Now that we have all of that established, let's get to the part you've all been waiting for. The actual episodes. As previously said, there are 13 episodes of this show, though episode 9 at the time of this video has only surfaced online in German, so the English language version of that episode is currently considered lost. In fact, until early 2017, only 3 episodes were even available online. There is no official release of this show yet. That's a shock. Let's start with episode 1, Bad Seed. Bad Seed. Fitting. The episode itself is a standard pilot. You, you meet Seymour, he's a klutz and blows up the school. You know that old story. So he gets a job at a flower shop. A flower shop that hires 13 year old boys, what? To pay for it. This is never brought up again, ever, and only serves as an excuse for a 13 year old boy to work at a flower shop. Hey Jalisa, guess what they call Mr. Mushnik's flower shop? Well, it's Mushnik's floor? There's a little shop of flowers. That? doesn't even rhyme with horrors! The episode begins with Seymour saying he wants to be a nerd, as all true warriors strive for. But he lacks the smarts to do it. We see his mom, kinda, and then never again throughout the whole show. We see his daily routine of getting bullied and being bad at stuff. 
Why does Pain Driller always take his lunch if he only ever has a wheat germ? Where do we draw the line between stupidity and insanity? I don't know, but judging from these backgrounds, they sure drew a lot of them. So obviously, if Seymour doesn't want to leave Skid Row, his main goal, in theory, is to win Audrey's heart. But in typical 90s cartoon fashion, she doesn't notice him, and Seymour doesn't take the hint to, you know, move on. How will he ever get her to notice him? Hmm. I would have gone with decorating her locker for prom, but that works too. I also would like to point out that some episodes barely even feature Audrey or Mr. Mushnick, and you almost never see the shop doing any sort of business aside from Frankenstein's monster in Flower Boy. On the plus side, at least Seymour is just as bad at his job as he is in the musical. I'd be mad if you flooded my house too. This all culminates in the greatest bit of animation ever made. I fell for hours! So, Seymour encounters a seed, it grows into Junior, and we learn about his greatest desires. You know, if Seymour is the main character, why does Junior get the big I want song? Well, that requires the writers to give him more motivation outside of, dang, friend zoned again. We also learn about Junior's hypnosis and vegetable magnetism. He attempts to hypnotize Audrey into noticing Seymour, but the dude can never get his aim right. Oops. The episode ends with Junior helping Seymour keep his job, and everyone lives happily ever after. The first episode does at least do a decent job establishing the series' tone. The problem is that it establishes the series' tone. Here, let's take a look at some of the upcoming episodes with classic titles such as Back to the Fuchsia, Pulp Fiction, I Loathe, yes, Loathe Not Loathe, I Loathe a Parade, Untitled Halloween Episode, my favorite, and... Real men aren't made of quiche. William, can I go home yet? Not until your blood oath is fulfilled. Speaking of quiche, let's go over that episode real quick to see how this show tries to make a man out of us. In this episode, Audrey Jr. builds the Frankenstein monster out of cabbage. Well, at least we got some horrors in our little shop of horrors. Also, they let Pain Driller sing in this episode. Pain is right. Well, anyway, the episode is about how Seymour wants to be a real man, trademark, while Junior wants the plants to stand up for themselves. To accomplish this, they try to give a brain to the plants, but from the sound of it, Seymour lacks the brain. How about you and me cooking up a little experiment in plant improvement? I don't know how to cook. You don't know how to cook? This results in him taking home ec class for reasons. You know what else happens for reasons? Guess, take a guess at what exciting plotline they send Audrey, the future firefighter, on this time. Got your guesses in? Good! Her plotline is that she falls in love with a fridge. This episode is freaking sexist, and this show is anti-vegan propaganda! Let's keep going. Episode 4 is the science for episode. Seymour idolizes this football-headed professor who wants nothing more than for kids to have clean teeth. A noble mission in this day of high medical bills. Not so much in 1991. So naturally, the episode is all about Junior trying to turn all the children of the world into plants. I am not making any of this up. Look it up later on. Oh my god. They look later, they even do the shared body episode thing. Oh my gosh, that sounds horrifying. Little shop of horrifying, eh? Don't worry, they don't really show what effects it has on him other than Junior's head being with him. Though, I mean, did you want them to show that? We could spend all day going over every nook and cranny of the show, but for your time's sake, let's just go lights to be here and show you some of the best moments. DJ, hit it. To be or not to be. Spontaneous combustion. Do you need an actress? I can solve your problem. I'm sure you're very talented. Marriage is for the birds. I just had the strangest dream. I was a bird, wondering if I should build a nest. And suddenly, I knew that marriage was for me. But it made a lot of me happy. It's giving me the blues. I could have made a lot of me happy. Huge! Yeah, I like that. Arson Wells here. 
I have humbly consented to provide my insights and unique perspective in interpreting this annual tournament of Hoses Parade. Ich werde dieses Stück angehauen und Tom muss kurz entsaften. Erst existiere ich nicht und jetzt existiere ich zweimal. Okay, lastly, before we leave, can we just talk about the best episode of the series? There's a best episode? Episode 7, Air Jr. To really do it justice, we need to go over its whole plot. It is beautiful. <gasps> okay, so Seymour is playing football, but he sucks at it and doesn't want to do it anymore. But Jr. notices he's hurting the grass by playing, and that's no good. And Seymour says that in real football, they use cleats, which Jr. don't like at all. Luckily, Audrey is now a shoe saleswoman. So they take her to a shoe store so Judy can find a pair of shoes with wings and gives it to Seymour after they sing the big foot fetish song. So Judy uses his vegetable magnetism on the rubber wings of the shoe to telekinetically make Seymour fly for a while. And, and then they make him crash into a blimp. This is all part of Junior's ingenious plan to have the blimp lower a ladder to let go of Seymour so Junior can climb on the blimp because why should he have to fly himself, you know? So he drives it up to the football stadium and shouts over the blimp's microphone to get the grass to wake up and attack the humans only to reveal it's turf, not grass. Episode end. Drink Bud Light. I mean, really, a rubber tree. There's no way that's a real th Oh, yeah, that that is a... That trees come... Rubber comes from the trees. Okay, wow, never mind. Okay, so, Little Shop. In closing, what did you guys think? Sing well said. So, for me, this show is pretty hilarious for all the wrong reasons. It screams that 1970s, 80s adaptational cartoon atmosphere, and while terrible, you can't look away. It misses the point in every facet, but you can't help but smile at how dumb it is. If you're looking for something legitimately good, stay away. And for the Little Shop aficionados, I'd only look at it as a curiosity piece. But for those looking for a so bad it's good cartoon catastrophe, you can't go wrong with this. And I guess that wraps it up. I would like to thank Citizen Hal and Jalisa for working with me on this video. It's been great having you. If you like them in this video, check out their channels, links in the description and in the cards above. As for me, if you want to see more content, click on the subscribe button down below, hit the bell if you want. Make sure to leave a like and comment to let me know if you enjoyed the video. As for me, I got some unfinished business with a certain eighth wonder. See you next time. Heck! Heckity darn! <laughs> Shoot! <laughs> no! <laughs> no swearing! Doesn't pizza have plants in it? Does he know? Does, does Junior know? And, and Burrs too? What, what even? Is, is he okay? <laughs>